Um, so the title of the talk is Uncovering the Mysteries of the Narwhal, and perhaps we'll, we'll do a little bit of that over the next 20 minutes or, or hour and a half. Um, I thought I'd just put up a map to give you an idea of, of what part of the world I'm talking about when I refer to where these animals live. So the, the yellow star, hopefully you all recognize, is, is here in Seattle. And the red box basically identifies uh, Greenland and, and Baffin Island. I don't think I can reach here, but Greenland is the, the big white, basically ice-covered island on the right, and Baffin Island is the smaller island um, that's more brown color on the left. So just a little bit of background, I, I wanted to just tell you, um, for the most part, I'll be talking about narwhals in Greenland, so I thought I'd give you just a couple slides on, on what Greenland is and what the people, who the people are that live there. Um, Greenland is mostly ice. 81% of Greenland is completely covered in ice, and it's basically one giant ice cap that is um, over 1,500 miles long, over 600 miles wide, and about 9,000 feet thick. And basically the only inhabitable part of Greenland is the coastline, which is very, very rocky. You can kind of see some of the brown, brown area uh, there in the photo, and that's a big glacier draining into, into the, the sea. And if we boiled Greenland down to water, we would get about 264 million gallons of water for every person on Earth. So it's quite a lot of ice. So who are the people that live in Greenland um, and, and the Canadian Arctic? Um, these people are, are Inuits who have basically forged a, a very successful relationship with a, a very inhospitable climate, um, which would be the high Arctic. This is a, a photo from a, a small settlement in West Greenland. Um, historically, uh, people uh, have lived here for, for many, many hundreds of, of years, and they, they existed in these this sort of raised areas like a sod house, and you can see there's a, an entrance hole that people actually stayed in during the winter and came out and generally traveled around during the summer uh, foraging for, for resources. But today, people live in, in houses that look pretty much like what you and I live in, um, for the most part, except they're not always that um, welcoming. So, um, so this is just a, another map that, that kind of zooms into the area I'll be talking about. And uh, these narwhals are, are basically found in, in every place you see on this map. Um, they're distributed in Nunavut, which is the territory of, of Canada and both on the west coast of Greenland and the east coast of Greenland. And the key areas are really this, this Baffin Bay, you can kind of see um, labeled in the middle, and, and Davis Strait. So who lives in the Arctic and why is that relevant to the narwhal? So um, people living in, in the Canadian Arctic and, and the Greenlandic Arctic are are traditional subsistence hunters. And the reason I bring humans into this, at least in the start of the talk, is because I, I think there's an important relationship between humans and, and narwhals that it's, it's good that everybody sort of has in mind as I, I go about the talk. Um, these three guys are, are uh, narwhal hunters that, that live in northwest Greenland. Those are handmade kayaks, and they, um, they basically make a living by um, hunting resources, uh, not only narwhals, but a lot of other species uh, uh, throughout the year. And these guys also happen to be um, our assistants. So they, they assist the biologists and, and come on our trips with us and are quite fantastic people to work with. Um, in Greenland, there's about 60,000 people. About 85% of those are, are subsistence hunters. And in Nunavut, which is the Canadian region, there's about 30,000 people. Again, about 80% are, are hunters. And the, the culture of, of, or this relationship with narwhals as, as has gone on for many hundreds of years, I just put this picture up here to show you that this is an image of a, a hunter from 1915. And this is a photo I took in 2005, um, which isn't much different except he's not wearing polar bear pants. He's wearing a rubber, rubber overalls. So that brings us to the species that we'll be talking about tonight, the narwhal. So the Latin name for the narwhal is monodon monoceros, and that means one tooth, one horn. And for those of you that know what the narwhal uh, is, that is 
probably um, based on the very well-known feature of the tusk, and you can see that here in the image. The tusk is basically a giant tooth that grows out of the left upper lip of the male, and it grows in a spiral fashion, and it can be up to three meters long, so it's nine feet long. And the, the word narwhal actually also has an interesting meaning. Uh, the, the prefix nar means corpse, and whale or veil in, uh, in Old Norse refers to whale. So the narwhal is the corpse whale. And that refers to the coloration of the animal. And you can see here it has this like gray and white mottled pattern, which unfortunately re resembles a drowned sailor um, that may have been pulled out of the water. And so thus they got named after, after that. So the narwhal tusk has been the subject of interest for, for centuries. Uh, the Vikings, uh, when they were exploring the North Atlantic, they went to Greenland and they returned with narwhal tusks and told great stories about what animal they came from. And that's actually the source of the myth of the unicorn. So um, that's, that's where we all got the idea of a horse walking around with a big tusk. Uh, trade in narwhal tusks continued through uh, the 18 and 1900s. Um, with whalers who would go up to the Arctic and look for large whales like bowhead whales and then return with, with tusks and sell them all over the world for many different reasons. Um, tusk trade is very regulated today. There's actually a ban on export of tusks from Greenland and, um, and not very many tusks are exported from, from Canada. But I just thought I'd show a couple images to, to show you how really influential this animal was. Um, this is a a painting from about 1600 of the unicorn, which we all know was based on the narwhal. And this is a really fantastic throne you can find in, in Copenhagen, where Denmark's King Christian V built an entire throne out of narwhal tusks. So every single one of those sort of long poles you see is actually a piece of a narwhal tusk. So it was, it was very prestigious to have pieces of this, this exotic animal. So I thought I would just include a couple slides on what the tusk is really for, because I think that will probably be the first question I get as soon as this 20-minute this talk is over. And so I thought I'd walk through a couple of options or sort of theories people have put out. Um, the first idea is, do they spear fish or spear their food? And you might notice from this image, this narwhal actually happens to have a fish stuck on the end of its tusk, which is complete, a complete accident. But its mouth is also down here. And you can imagine if your dinner is stuck two meters in front of you and you have no hands, it's not very convenient. So it wouldn't be very practical to have your tusk be for spearing fish. And what about breaking ice? You know, maybe they kind of use it as a chisel to open up a hole so they can breathe. And we actually have pretty good evidence that, that they can, narwhals can break ice. It's, it tends to be very thin ice. But what they actually do is they come up with their, their um, back and push, push the ice up and create a small hole. And those are these pockets you see here uh, that uh, I took a photo of this standing on the ice. So the tusk is not for that. Um, so what is the tusk for? There are a lot of other theories. Um, uh, Herman Melver actually wrote that the tusk could possibly be a letter opener. So many people have had many interesting ideas. But a pretty smart guy named Charles Darwin came up with, um, spent a lot of time pondering the narwhal. And to just to skip this quote and come down to the key point, which is what we call in biology sexual selection. So basically, when animals have a very flashy, fancy appendage, and it tends to be the males that have that appendage to attract females, um, it's very common in the animal kingdom, and that's essentially what the narwhal tusk is. Narwhals use their tusks for um, competition between other males and for essentially um, dis deciding who's dominant and who should get the, get the woman. And it's not that different from the feathers of a peacock, which you can see a very beautiful blue male in the left, or the mane of a lion. So I thought I would include a couple slides on how we do research on narwhals, because um, this, this is, can be kind of fun and interesting, and, and it takes a little bit of creativity to actually learn something about these, these animals. So um, for the most part, we study narwhals in the summer, and that's because in the summer, the Arctic is light. 
there's occasionally some sun, there's no sea ice, and you can actually access the whales because they come close to shore. And this is an image of a, a typical field camp we might, uh, we might stay in for, for three to four weeks. Basically, we identify a site where we know there are narwhals. We fly in with this, this, this airplane is a twin otter, and you can see it has these big tundra tires that basically allow it to land in, in any surface. And they dump all of our stuff in a big pile and fly away and come back four weeks later. And we make a small camp and, and, and do our work. Um, this is our camp, a camp I've, I've been in for maybe six or eight years now, and this is a, a summer photo. So, um, The alternative is you can live on a boat, and you can actually access areas um, that narwhals inhabit if you are mobile on the water. And so this is a, a boat, this red boat here, being loaded by this kind of creative approach uh, in northwest Greenland is a boat we lived on for... Um, about four weeks uh, for two years in a row. And basically we, we took this boat and sailed for about 48 hours into North Greenland, dragging our, our two inflatable boats behind us and we were able to, to find a site where we could, we could access whales. And this is where we, we ended up. So that was the, the August of 2006. Um, a lot of people ask, what do you do when you're in these remote areas with, um, yeah, it's sort of uh, luxuries of, of our everyday life, like restrooms and bathing. We tend not to have restrooms because you can see here one year we actually built one, and that's this, this small outhouse uh, standing in, up there in the, in the photo on the left. But you have to be pretty brave to go in and shut the door with yourself inside because you happen to have polar bears basically walking by continually. And I don't know about you, but I don't like to be in a small box with those walking around. Bathing, you tend not to take a shower or you create something out of a bucket. One year we, we did actually invent a, a shower, you can see here, uh, which is, is, um, is rare, but is possible. Or you can be extremely brave and run in for about five seconds. And um, cuisine, cuisine, we tend to, so these are a group of, of hunters I work with uh, every summer, and we tend to eat a lot of traditional food, although you don't see that in the photo here. Um, whatever they might catch or, or hunt, we'll, we'll often serve and cook. Um, and uh, that can vary from a number of species of birds and fish and caribou and seals and whales. So studying the narwhal, um, I have to say after 10 years of studying this animal, I think it's probably one of the worst study animals you could choose. Uh, because they spend basically most of their life underwater at very deep depths. They tend to be several hundred kilometers offshore and they really love very dense sea ice. So none of those things are very practical for a biologist trying to learn something. Um, so we've had to be pretty creative and um, the, one of the main sort of approaches we've used for studying these animals is what we call satellite telemetry. And what you're looking at is a, a small transmitter that's about the size of a deck of cards. And that transmitter has two AA batteries and a microprocessor. And uh, it also has a, a, a pressure transducer so it can measure the depth. And all of that information is sort of summarized and sent up through this, and this black antenna you see here um, to satellites. And so if we are able to catch a narwhal and put one of these tags on the narwhal, we can actually learn a lot about what they do because these tags will tell you where an animal moves every single day and what they did underwater. So how deep they dove, how much time they spent underwater, different things like that. This is just a schematic of how that works. Hypothetically, you have a narwhal with a tag and that, that tag sends transmissions to polar orbiting satellites. So there are lots of satellites going overhead all the time. And if you have uh, your transmissions picked up by enough satellites, it can basically sort of triangulate where that animal is on the surface of the Earth and send that information to a receiving station. And that information is then compiled and sent to me here at UW. So I can basically sit in my office at UW and follow narwhals in Greenland. But that all depends on if you can catch one. And so how do you catch a narwhal? Um, basically, you set a very big net, really large net that is uh, maybe 30 meters deep and 
uh, I don't know, 100, 200 meters long. And you put buoys on top, like you see here. And you sit and you look at that net for a really long time, many, many weeks. And just to give you an idea, we basically have to have a 24-hour watch of this net. So, I mean, you don't want an animal to drown, so you're watching the net constantly to see if one goes in. And to get an idea, this is our entire summer, the dates up here on the top, and the 24-hour watch on the, on, the, um, on the left. And the star is where we caught a whale, and everything else is where you sat and stared at the net. So there's a lot of waiting. And the waiting can be quite nice. This is just a situation of some of us sitting and waiting for narwhals to show up. But after weeks and months of that, if nothing happens, sometimes we have some serious depressions in our field camp. So um, before, um, I would say actually, we mostly catch icebergs, and that's um, a problem because an iceberg can take your net away very quickly. For every one narwhal I've caught, must have also caught 200 icebergs. And so you spend a lot of time rearranging the icebergs with your small boats, and I just thought I'd show you a few pictures of that. Varying techniques of lassoing the iceberg, pulling it out of the net, or just pushing for a really long time to get it out of the way. But occasionally we do actually catch a narwhal, and basically the animal goes in the net and it's very obvious, the buoys go under, there's a lot of hysteria, everybody rushes out, and the key thing is to get the whale up to the surface as fast as possible. And this is a female uh, that we, we captured, and, and once they're free of the net and at the surface, we, we restrain them um, for about 30 minutes, and we put a transmitter on their back uh, attached to their, their dorsal ridge, and you can see us doing that here. And those transmitters give us a lot of information. This is a map that shows you uh, movements of narwhals. And for every color, every color represents a different population of narwhals that we've tracked um, or we've captured and, and tracked. And the key thing is you can see that the colors sort of originate up in, in the top part of the map or the high Arctic. And those animals move out of those areas into offshore Baffin Bay and Davis Strait. And that's where they spend the winter. So those are, that's what we call their wintering grounds. Whereas these coastal areas where I have the, the labels and the dates um, is what we call their summering grounds. I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer and I'm kind of stuck so I can't, I can't point very well. Um, so um, so these, these tags have taught us a lot about what, what these whales do and uh, not only where they go, so the migration maps I just showed you, but also what they do underwater. And what we have learned is that these are some of the deepest diving whales um, in the world. Narwhals dive up to 1,800 meters uh, 15 to 20 times per day. So they're basically diving to the bottom of Baffin Bay over and over and over again. That's a pretty extreme behavior, and you might ask, well, why on earth would you do that? And it's because these whales feed on flatfish, which are Greenland halibut that live at the bottom of the sea. So they basically have to go to the bottom to access the fish and then go back up to get a breath and go back down to get another fish. So it's a pretty, um, a pretty intense period, and it lasts for about six months. To give you some uh, idea of really what, what, how intense that is, so um, 1,800 meters is about 4,500 feet. And if we take the Space Needle, which we all know well, and pile up eight Space Needles uh, on top of each other, that's about one narwhal dive, just to give you an idea of, of, of scale. Um, and our record is, is almost 6,000 feet uh, diving depth, so over one mile. So um, hopefully you've all eaten because this is a little bit gross, but that's part of biology. So how do you find out what these, how did we find out these whales are eating halibut? Well, what we did was we accessed, um, because these animals are, are hunted for subsistence, we have access to samples. We can sample whales. We can look at their blubber or their muscle, and we can look at their stomachs. And so some lucky person can, can actually look inside a narwhal stomach, and they're pretty cool because they have these, these finger-like folds that capture all of the prey that they eat. And the prey are digested down, but the hard parts, like fish ear bones, which are these small white circ circular things you see here, or squid beaks get caught in the stomach. So you can actually take out these hard parts and figure out what size fish narwhals are eating, what species fish narwhals are eating, same thing with squid, and sort of reconstruct the diet, and also reconstruct how much they eat. 
So we've done that, and um, just to be, well, this is actually the job, not a very popular job of going through the stomach down here, but to summarize, basically um, what we found is that narwhals feed very intensely in winter. The stomachs are always full. Um, there's a lot of fresh, fresh remains of halibut. Their stomachs are never empty. In summer, when we look at stomachs, they're for the most part empty. So we don't really think narwhals eat very much during the summertime. And that explains this very intense diving behavior. So um, I just want to have a, a couple of slides about the, the ice because the narwhal's relationship with sea ice is, is very, kind of very important. Um, narwhals, when they, when they make a migration out of these submarine grounds, they actually depart ahead of the sea ice. Uh, this is a, a graph my colleague Harry Stern made for me here in the audience. Um, and these whales, they, they leave early, usually at the end of October, and they tend to move ahead of the ice. And the ice is what you see here in these multicolors. So that's the sea ice that's forming in the fall as the Arctic gets colder and darker and things freeze over. And in wintertime, they, they find their wintering grounds and they stop, and the ice basically surrounds them. So they spend the entire winter in very dense ice. So some work, recent work we've done is try and count how many narwhals are out there or just estimate what the densities of narwhals are. Um, in, in, in marine mammal biology, we call these aerial surveys for abundance, but I think we can also just call it how we estimate the number of narwhals on the wintering grounds. So we take that same airplane, that twin otter, out 200 kilometers from shore with a long-range fuel tank so we can get home, and we fly uh, with observers that are positioned in the airplane and look out the window and count whales. Um, and at the same time, we record, we have a hole in the bottom of the airplane with a video camera that records what the ice is like and also looks to see if there are any, basically records the track line, the, the line that we're flying on to see if we miss any narwhals. And um, this is just a map of what that would be. So you originate here uh, in, in West Greenland and you fly for two hours offshore to get to where these narwhals live. And then you do as many lines as you can and count as many whales as you can and then you get home before you run out of gas. Um, and um, what we, when we've done that, we've actually found, this is all really recent information, um, we found some pretty interesting things. So we, we surveyed one of these wintering grounds and, and estimated about 19,000 narwhals in this survey region or this box. But when we look at the sea ice in that region, we can actually see that, that most of that area is completely ice covered and only 2% is open water. And these whales are mammals and breathe oxygen, so they, they need open water to breathe which means that these whales are tightly packed into these cracks in the ice at a density of, of over 73 narwhals per square kilometer, which is pretty neat. We can also look at, at images to show us basically um, what kinds of habitats narwhals like. So this is very old ice with these ridges, and this sort of lighter uh, gray region is what we call new ice or light ice that narwhals can actually break. And then this black region, you see open water, and if we zoom in, we can actually see two narwhals in that open water. We've also gone through um, images that have no open water, and we see evidence of whales using this very new ice and, again, breaking these breathing holes with their back. So you can see those bumps here. So it's a, it's a tedious job, but it basically allows us to document what kinds of habitats these whales live in. And that's just the photo I, I showed you earlier of how they break that ice. And my last two slides are just to mention um, kind of an important thing for narwhal biology is what we call sea ice entrapments. And these are pretty interesting events. Um, so this, this species is really good at being in the ice and, and very skilled, but they're not always on top of things. And what can happen in the Arctic is conditions can change very rapidly and an open area can freeze over quickly and trap a lot of whales and basically limit or reduce or eliminate their access to oxygen. And we have a number of, of these cases documented throughout basically the past, past 100 years. Um, these are just some tusks that were collected from a very large ice entrapment of over 1,000 narwhals in 1915. And that's, everyone asks that narwhals aren't stuck in the ice with their tusks sticking out. They actually have, have been pulled out of the ice and the tusks have been removed. And not only um, is access to oxygen a problem, but of course when you're stuck in a very small hole, you can see that some uh, creatures like polar bears show up and like to pull you out and, 
and eat you. So this is um, pretty interesting, and I, I just thought I'd mention, I don't know if some of you read about this in the news, but um, in 2008, there was a very large ice entrapment in, in Nunavut uh, on Baffin Island where over 500 narwhals were trapped uh, in the ice and, and died. And so we're, we're right now really trying to understand why these ice entrapments happen and sort of document the frequency and, and if there are any patterns uh, at all. So I think that my time is up for this talk and now you can drink some beer and then ask some questions. Mm-hmm. <laughs>